Hey there, welcome. Today I am with my friend, colleague, mentor, Gail Perry, and I'm so excited that she's agreed to to let me interview her. I've actually interviewed her several times before, and we'll put the links to those awesome videos below this one. But today we are going to be talking about myths and misconceptions around raising major gifts. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to um, talk a little bit about how I met Gail. She is the expert when it comes to raising major gifts, <laughs> capital campaigns. You, you are the expert. <laughs> <laughs> and training your board. I mean, uh, I have followed Gail for a long time, and if you don't yet, you should too. So anyways, I'm super excited to be chatting with her again. We've been colleagues for a long time now, probably more than a decade. Um, and I'm so excited. So hey, Gail. Hello, hello, Amy. How are you? And I'm honored that you uh, say such nice things. And I just have to say, everybody, that when I first met Amy, I was keynoting the uh, AFP New Jersey conference. We were talking about my new book. And Amy's like, I think she's this young whippersnapper, right? And Amy says, you know, I want to write a book. And I'm thinking, young lady, you have no idea how much trouble this is. <laughs> and, and I just thought, young lady, what, you know, that's really interesting. And then Whamba, she's written three books. I could only get one book out of myself because I was done. It was so much work. <laughs> well, thank you for the kind words back. But anyways, let's, let's get to it. What yeah. are some of the myths and misconceptions that people have around raising major gifts? Gail? Oh, it's so much fun to talk about that. One of the biggest myths that I find is that um, people think that they can handle a large number of prospects. Uh, for major gift development. And if you see a larger organization, somebody will have what we call a portfolio of major gift prospects that are maybe um, 150 people. Uh, and organizations that are really big that have lots and lots and lots of potential major donors literally uh, load up their various major gift officers with all these prospects. And even if you're a small organization, you know, I work with all sizes in my major gift coaching program, everybody starts with like 250 or 200. And you know what, Amy, it's the people who narrow down to about 20. Oh. Even, even the law, even the person from a big university foundation who was with us last year, she narrowed it down to about 20. And then she had sort of a back burner. And they're the people who are raising the big money. I'm so happy to sit, hear you say that, Gail, yeah. because I always say 20. And people look at me and uh, they've had experience maybe at a big shop or they've done some other work with different consultants and they have 75 or 100 or 150 or 500 prospects on their list. But I completely agree. Your A working list is 20 people. That's how many you can focus on at a time. And it is a big myth that you need yeah. a big prospect list to be successful at raising major gifts. Well, you know, good old Penelope Burke is so brilliant. And she, um, she's been talking lately about raising more money from fewer donors, mm -hmm. which is totally not intuitive, right? More yeah. money, fewer donors. And people go, what, what? But then you run the numbers and you explain. But let me tell you a quick story. When I first started out in fundraising many years ago, um, my, my scary vice president at Duke University was like my mentor, and he was like the scary dude, right? Um, and he said, Gail, major gift fundraising is like spinning plates on a stick. He said, you can only spin but so many plates. You like give, he said, you give one little touch and one little touch and a touch. And he said, Gail, what happens if you spin, try to spin too many plates? They all crash. Mm, what a great analogy. I love yeah, that. Yeah. And he said that um, if you're only spending the number that you can really handle, then when somebody's ready to give, you, uh, you, you are in charge of removing the stick. He said, harvesting the gift is the word. He used. <laughs> and he said, Only then can you start spinning another plate. Yeah, well, it yeah. makes sense. I mean, we all know the 80-20 rule, right? Yeah. The Pareto principle. And, you know, it's probably even closer to 90-10 is what we're finding in fundraising, especially with regard to major gifts. Tell people what that is. What am I talking about? Well, you know, the Pareto Principle and, and 90-10 is that you get 90% of your money from 10% of your people, but I'm seeing numbers that are more like 
um, uh, not, you know, 95% of your money from 3% of your people, because there's this, there's this concept in philanthropy right now that I've seen tossed around called top heavy philanthropy in mm -hmm. which the very, very wealthy donors who are getting wealthier, at least in the U S mm -hmm. um, are, 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 our pool of um, wealthy people is getting wealthier and the top of the donor pyramid is quite, quite, full of resources, you know, mm -hmm. so they are literally able to have more power as donors and philanthropists and make the larger gifts. Yeah. And, you know, the donor pyramid too is, I don't think very, um, very intuitive. And maybe that's, that's not a misconception. That's a standard thing. But let mm -hmm. me tell you another major ma misconception. Yeah. But this is my, my new word in fundraising, Amy, drum roll. My new okay. Word. <laughs> my new favorite word is nurture. You okay. Know? The nurture and you know it's somehow nurture feels like a mother and a baby or a parent with child or a friendship you know you're trying to nurture a friendship and I think the whole idea of nurturing is a great concept for people and, and you know there are a lot of people who don't understand major gift fundraising who are budgeting who are trying to manage who are making decisions about major mm -hmm. gifts yeah and maybe if we can promote the concept of nurturing I think that they will understand that it's not so high pressure Mm. So some among people who don't understand our work, they um, there are many. You have heard many misconceptions too. Can't you just go right out and ask? And you know, how long is it going to take you to close a gift? And press, press, press. And if we and if we start talking about the concept of nurturing, yeah, I think it becomes a whole lot more fun. Yeah, I and, mean that's. I think that's the next step in terms of what we have been talking about for years and that's building relationships, but yeah. maybe people aren't sure what that means or how to do it. So nurturing is a nice word. Yeah. I mean, I, I like to use an analogy of how do you stay in touch with a college friend or an aunt that lives out of state? You have to nurture the relationship, and it's the same. The same is true with a major donor. Yeah, I just moved from Chapel, Raleigh to Chapel Hill, mm -hmm. and I have this huge social network in Raleigh, and I want to keep nurturing all those friends, or else if it, if you're not nurturing a network, it will go away. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so one of the misconceptions that I'm trying to tackle with the concept of nurture is that these sort of people who don't understand our work think that it's so much more business-like than it really is. I mean, yes, you need to be business-like. You're, you're representing your organization. You're talking about the donor's interest, but you're not pushy. Yeah. You're not pushy. You're not pushy. That's right. Um, and this, what, what's another myth or misconception? I think that people think that asking is a really big deal with major gift fundraising. <laughs> yes, that's true. I'm so sick of people wanting a, a presentation on the art of the ask. No, you know, let's talk about the art of developing the relationship that the donor says, how can I help you? Mm. Um, you know, there, there's a whole new movement in, in our fundraising field with major gifts and capital campaigns in which we are so the concept of being donor centered is so front and center and you take your lead from the donor you're at you're interviewing your donor you're finding out your donors hot buttons um those those sorts those sorts of approaches are so much more effective yeah and yeah. so it's not about the ask in fact my, my buddies in australia and the exponential guys um brian and um craig said that you will you will like this they said to me once they said that major gifts fundraising is about developing relationships capital campaigns are about the ask oh interesting about asking uh -huh. you know, because, because that's really interesting because major gift fundraising you you do your major gift development and prior to a campaign right so that you get everybody ready and then you go boom we have this exciting opportunity you want let's talk about it Right. I want to focus back on something you said, and that is about getting the person to ask, how can, how can I help? Right. I mean, I think those are really important words because you still need to be prepared with what your organization needs and wants and how they can help. But once they've asked, your ask is in the form of an answer. Right. Yeah. So if they ask, if you're having such a compelling conversation and such a good storyteller that they ask, how can I help? Then you can say, you know what? There are a lot of ways you can help actually. And so your ask turns so much softer. So much softer. Yeah. I love that. So one more, do we have one more myth or misconception or you have a whole list? I don't know. I think sometimes when we're talking about, sometimes you have to pop the question. 
right. Mm. And the classic popping of the question is, we were hoping you were consider, would consider, use the word consider, a gift of X. Yeah. Maybe it's a gift of X amount of money for this project. And so I, I've been resurrecting my concept of what I call the MPI fun, fundraising formula. Okay. Formula. You ask, you have, it's one sentence, you have money, you have the project, and then you have the impact. So, Mr. Amy, we, 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 we are hoping you would consider a, a $100,000 scholarship, you know, 100000 $100, that's the money, right. scholarship for kids from your area of New Jersey. Yeah. That's the project. But yep. what people forget is the impact, and that's the romance of the ask. Mm. You know, so that these wonderful kids that you know from uh, from your community and your high schools and people in your whole area can have the kind of opportunities that you had in life and so they can do blah 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 I mean that's the exciting part of the ass totally MPI I love that acronym that's that's my new favorite acronym yeah. because I always tell people it. remember the ask isn't about the money it's about what you're doing. It's about curing cancer or educating children. But MPI, I love it. I love it. I call it playing the violin. You know, you're romancing. You know, you get all excited and you start waving your hands. And, and remember, I mean, you know this as well. well you know this too, that this, the, the person in front of the donor, their energy is so important. Yeah. And, and that, you know, you have to be happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have to be like you know, gosh, excited about what you were hoping to create. Cause so many people are like, Oh, we're so nervous. Well, you know, we don't know how to ask and bless your heart. You don't really want to do this. Do you? Or, you know, we've seen some messed up, messed up ask in our day. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you love that? You don't really have to do that. I know it's a lot of money. Is it too big for you? Right. I mean, um, I actually did this week's blog post on optimism and its role in major gift fundraising. Oh, and no how problem. if you expect them to say yes, then the chances are that you're going to ask smarter questions and framed questions in a way that will get to a yes, as opposed to if you're anticipating a no, you almost go away before it even happens. Right. Yeah. And that's just, yeah. that's just let me give you one more, and this yeah. may be, this is really in, an incendiary comment I'm getting ready to make. Is <laughs> I think that board members may or may not be helpful in an ask. Mm. And there have been many times that board members have been not helpful in an ask. And when I talk about this, when I'm presenting, everybody in the whole room nods. And um, <laughs> board members are wonderful, well-meaning people, okay? that We love them. But sometimes, you know, they're not trained professionals, like they will talk too much. Mm -hmm. They will interrupt the donor. They will sidetrack the conversation. Mm -hmm. They will um, blurt out an ask that is inappropriate and not what you had planned. You know, they can't follow the script and the timing. Right. Or you put the question on the table and then the donor says, of course, you can do this is so much less. The board member right. would say that. Right, so, right. All of these are true stories that I have experienced or other people have shared with me. Yeah. So this whole idea that we want board members to be out there asking, I would not send one of my wonderful, well-meaning board member volunteers out on a call by him or herself, right. ever. Right. And especially with an important ask. And, and it's rarely done these days. So it's interesting that, that the whole role of board members in this kind of asking, I think, is still very muddy. Mm. And people have a lot of misconceptions about what's appropriate and what's not and what the proper role is. What do you think? What do you yeah. think? No, I think you're totally right. But I just want to emphasize that that doesn't mean that board members can't help with fundraising and major oh, gift fundraising, so much. right? We want them to do lots of things, including identifying people, opening doors, helping with cultivation, thanking people, right? But sometimes it is not helpful for them to ask. It depends on the board member. I mean, you have to get to know the your board members that you have. There are going to be few, a few that are very powerful askers and a and few that are disasters. You. Yeah. disasters. Yeah. It's yeah. Not, so it's not, it's not one size fits all. You right. You have to customize your approach for the people involved. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Absolutely right. Gail, it's always so fun to talk to you. Tell us, what you're up to, what projects you're working on, if you want to talk about the insiders or your capital yeah, campaign work. Well, you know, 
my, my major gift coaching group runs um, from February to November every year, and we're maxing out again this year, and they're wonderful organizations. We're in the middle of tackling prospect research right now, and uh, I'm expanding my consulting business. Oh. And, and it's really, really, really fun to be back uh, in the field with real-life situations and wonderful people. Um, mm -hmm. We're tackling projects here in North Carolina right now, but everything that we've proposed we've gotten in terms of our group. So we're very <laughs> excited about potential growing. Good. Everybody, everybody wants you as their consultant, Gail. That's excellent. Yeah, thank well, you so much, Amy. Well, we'll link to your website for sure. So thank, thank you. you so much for taking the time. And uh, I, I can't wait to talk to you again soon. I'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks, Gail.